Open an average American high school or college history textbook, and there you will find a number of military conflicts that the United States participated in, from the American Revolution of 1776 to the more recent wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. However, one war not often included was one of America's most brutal overseas military campaigns, one which involved the murder of Filipino women and children. Torture. Concentration camps. Deception. And the outright betrayal of an ally. That war was the Philippine American War. If by chance you should find a school textbook that mentions this military conflict, in all likelihood, it would be downgraded to nothing more than an insurrection and wrongly referred to as the Philippine Insurrection which implies the notion that the Filipino revolutionaries who liberated Luzon, the Visayas, and northern Mindanao during the 1898 Spanish-American War and who already exercised military, economic, and political authority in the provinces surrendered to them by the Spanish were somehow insurrecting or rebelling against a nearly non-existent American authority which, according to the accounts of two of Admiral George Dewey's personnel, only extended as far as the Navy Yard at Cavite and a three-mile radius from the center of Manila. This rather selective retelling of Filipino-American history is not limited to what is taught in American schools. This too can be seen in popular American media. In an episode entitled, Put Up Your Dukes, on the History Channel's popular American sitcom, Pawn Stars. The star of that show, Mr. Rick Harrison, stated in no uncertain terms that there was no Philippine War. One may wonder how is it possible in the 21st century to get away with either omitting or, as in the case of Mr. Rick Harrison, outright denying the existence of a war that lasted at least four times longer than the Spanish-American War which preceded it. While many explanations can be given, at the heart of the issue is that many American historians and the United States government continues to deny to this very day official acknowledgement of the existence of the Republica Filipina, or as it is known in English, the First Philippine Republic, which was an independent Filipino government established and inaugurated by the representatives of the First Philippine Congress on January 23, 1899, with General Emilio Aguinaldo serving as its first congressionally recognized president. Today, this denial of official recognition for Aguinaldo's presidency and the republic that he led essentially allowed American historians to misrepresent the Philippine-American War not as a war between two countries, but merely as a Tagalog insurrection against the United States. Nothing better illustrates this point than the words of the U.S. Secretary of War, Elihu Root, who in 1899, during a speech in Chicago, stated, Are we fighting the Philippine nation? No, there is none. There are hundreds of islands inhabited by more than 60 tribes speaking more than 60 languages, and all but one are ready to accept American sovereignty. We are opposed by only the single tribe of the Tagalos, which actually should be Tagalogs. Later, other influential Americans of that period would make similarly deceptive public statements in line with those made by Secretary Root. Admiral George Dewey, the victor of the Battle of Manila Bay and the individual who sought General Aguinaldo's alliance with the United States against the Spanish, had this to say before a Senate committee after the U.S. overthrew the First Philippine Republic in 1901. I knew that there was no government in the whole of the Philippines. Our fleet had destroyed the only government there was, and there was no other government. And ten years after Dewey's testimony, a colleague of his, Dean Worcester, who served alongside him in the First American Commission to the Philippines, also known as the First Philippine Commission, or the Sherman Commission, had this to say. There is no cause for vain regrets. We did not destroy a republic in the Philippines. There never was anything to destroy which even remotely resembled a republic. Yet, despite these reassuring words, by the end of this lecture you will see, 
from just a few U.S. military reports and other statements presented here, that these military and government officials deceived the American people when they publicly portrayed the Philippines as not having had an independent republic already in existence before the United States Congress ratified the Treaty of Paris and officially annexed the Philippines on February 6, 1899. Before presenting the evidence referred to, however, it is important to clarify a misconception about the extent of the First Philippine Republic's jurisdiction. American officials and supporters of President McKinley's annexation of the Philippines could not completely prevent word getting out that the Filipinos under Aguinaldo's leadership established a republic in the months leading up to the outbreak of war between the Filipinos and Americans. In order to discredit Aguinaldo, the First Philippine Republic, and some Americans who publicly acknowledged the Filipino government's existence, such as James Henderson Blount, McKinley's supporters attempted to portray the First Philippine Republic as a self-proclaimed government with no public support from ethnic groups outside Southern Luzon, a region closely associated with Aguinaldo's fellow Tagalog people. President McKinley's appointed commissioner to the Philippines, Dean Worcester, for example, attempted to minimize the resistance to American occupation that the First Philippine Republic represented by referring to it as a strictly Tagalog affair and even referred to its soldiers as Tagalog invaders. Sadly, these false claims not only succeeded in fooling the American people of that period into believing that the majority of Filipinos wanted to be colonized, but it also had the unexpected effect of convincing some non-Tagalog Filipinos of today, particularly Visayan Filipinos, that the revolution in the Visayas was completely separate and had no affiliation with the First Philippine Republic. While it is important to acknowledge that the First Philippine Republic had not yet fully managed to incorporate all of Mindanao, particularly the provinces largely inhabited by the Moros or Muslims, before the Philippine-American War erupted, it is an absolute lie that this republic merely represented the Tagalog people of Luzon. Whether a Chinese Filipino, such as General Jose Ignacio Paua, an Indian Filipino, for instance, General Juan Calles, or even Spanish Filipinos, as was the case with Felipe Calderón y Roca, author of the 1899 Philippine Constitution, Jose Torres Bugayon, the hero of the Battle of La Loma, or Jose Palma, author of the lyrics to the Philippine National Anthem. The First Philippine Republic represented a diverse range of races in the Philippines, and certainly an equally diverse group of ethnicities. No less than the very president of the Estado Federal de Visayas, or the Federal State of the Visayas, had this to say about the First Philippine Republic, whose national capital was located in Malolos, in his response to U.S. General Marcus P. Miller's request that he be given permission to land U.S. troops in the Visayas. La autoridad del gobierno central en Malolos Además de estar fundada en los sagrados y naturales lazos de sangre, idioma, usos, costumbre, modo de ser, ideales, sacrificios, etc., etc., se funda también, principalmente en nuestra constitución política, que nació con la revolución y se ha manifestado en todos sus pasos. Y por tanto, esa autoridad del gobierno de Malolos, Sobre nosotros, data de fecha muy anterior al Tratado de París. En vista de todo lo expuesto, insistimos en no consentir el desembarco de sus fuerzas sin órdenes expresas de nuestro gobierno central en Malolos. Harro, Hilo Hilo, 8 de enero de 1899, El Presidente del Estado Federal de Bizayas, Roque López. Unfortunately, this letter is little known, despite having been submitted to the U.S. War Department and subsequently archived in the Philippine National Library's collection, as it is incomprehensible to most Filipino researchers today, since the imposition of English during the Americanization under U.S. occupation reduced the Castilian-Spanish-speaking Filipino population 
to near extinction, both during and after the Philippine-American War. Fortunately, General Miller, the recipient of this letter, would corroborate its contents in his military report for January of 1899, which was forwarded to the commanding general of the U.S. Army in the Philippines, General Elwell Otis. His report read in part, I have not landed the 51st Iowa on the island opposite to Iloilo, as two boat crews of troops of the 51st Iowa landed on the 5th instant and were met by over 75 to 100 natives armed with various weapons. As to the insurgents yielding to the order of the president and allowing occupation, it will not be done unless the central government at Malolos directs them to do so. In the nearby Visayan island of Cebu, a similar statement of recognition and support for President Aguinaldo's First Philippine Republic can be found. In a twist of irony, Dean Worcester, the U.S. official who misrepresented the resistance to American rule as nothing more than a strictly Tagalog affair, aided in contradicting himself when he published the following proclamation by one of the leading Visayan generals, the Cebuano Arcadio Mahilom, who served as the Counselor of Police and Internal Order for the provincial government of Cebu. As the government which the invaders are endeavoring to establish is always provisional, if all the inhabitants of this province are true Filipinos, they can easily and simply answer that we are subject to the will of the Honorable President, Senor Emilio Aguinaldo, whom we follow and recognize in this newborn republic as the President of the nation. Far from being a strictly Tagalog affair, it is evident from just these two accounts that Worcester and Secretary Root had severely understated the support and recognition President Aguinaldo and the Republica Filipina received from the non-Tagalog people of the Philippines. Yet, it was not only Filipinos who recognized the First Philippine Republic. The American military officers and officials in the Philippines, despite their numerous denials to the American public, demonstrated in their official reports and private letters that they were well aware of and acknowledged the existence and authority of the First Philippine Republic. The following four accounts are submitted as evidence to prove that point. The first evidence contradicts Admiral George Dewey's claim before a U.S. Senate committee that there was no government in the whole of the Philippines. Dated January 24, 1899, a letter addressed to Dewey from the U.S. military governor in the Philippines, Major General Elwell Otis, which was published in his official military report to Henry Corbin, the Adjutant General of the United States Army, is as follows. Things look a little ominous today. You have undoubtedly seen in the papers an account of yesterday's affairs at Malolos, vis vis the proclaiming of the Constitution, the proclaiming of Aguinaldo as President, Captain General, and everything else and the speech delivered by Paterno, in which he announced that they would drive the invader from the soil. The second evidence presented again refutes Admiral Dewey, but this time also Dean Worcester, who claimed that there never was anything in the Philippines to destroy, which even remotely resembled a republic. The evidence referred to is an excerpt from an address given at Cornell University by a man whom both Admiral Dewey and Professor Worcester were well acquainted with, Jacob Gold Sherman, President of the First Philippine Commission, which Dewey and Worcester were members of as per President McKinney's appointment. Although Sherman was slightly off by a year regarding Aguinaldo's official assumption of leadership in the revolution against Spain, 1897 rather than 1896 as he stated, his account accurately captures the course of events in the lead-up to the Republica's establishment in 1899, the year of his arrival to the islands. While Sherman also attempted to minimize Aguinaldo's jurisdiction to the Tagalog population and referred to the Philippine army as insurgents, his address, in contrast to his colleagues Dewey and Worcester, at the very least acknowledged that the insurgents had set up a Philippine Republic based on the constitution adopted by a Congress meeting at Malolos which claimed the right to exercise sovereign jurisdiction over the archipelago. Emilio Aguinaldo, the former military dictator, 
the leader of the insurrection of 1896 as well as that of 1898, was president of the Philippine Republic and commander-in-chief of its military and naval forces. The authority of the United States was limited to the city of Manila, and the people of Manila, Tagalog as they are, were in sympathy with the insurgents. The third evidence admitted here are excerpts from the U.S. military governor in the Philippines, Major General Elwell Otis, from his previously mentioned report to the Adjutant General of the United States Army. General Otis's report refers to December of 1898, a time when General Aguinaldo was still head of a revolutionary military government and a month before the First Philippine Congress would enact Felipe Calderon's constitution and inaugurate the First Philippine Republic in its place. The report states that All military stations outside of Luzon, with the exception of Zamboanga, turn over by Spaniards to inhabitants who may be denominated insurgents with more or less hostility to the United States. In December 1898, we find in northern and southeastern Luzon, in Mindoro, Samar, Leyte, Panay, and even on the coast of Mindanao, and in some of the smaller islands, the aggressive Tagalo or Tagalog, present in person and whether civilian or soldier, supreme in authority. The success which attended the political efforts of Aguinaldo and his close associates and gave them such sudden and unexpected power was not calculated to induce them to accept subordinate positions in a re-established government. And the original premeditated intention to control supremely at least a portion of the Filipino people had become firmly fixed. General Aguinaldo was at the zenith of his power. He dominated Manila and when he ordered that the birthday of the martyred Rizal, that is, Dr. Jose Rizal, should be appropriately observed there. Business was paralyzed, and not a native dared to pursue his accustomed daily labors. The final evidence for consideration comes from a report submitted to the U.S. War Department by Captain John R. M. Taylor, the assistant to the Chief of the Bureau of Insular Affairs. Published by Washington's Government Printing Office, endorsed by the Chief of the Bureau of Insular Affairs, Colonel Clarence R. Edwards, entitled Organization for the Administration of Civil Government Instituted by Emilio Aguinaldo and His Followers in the Philippine Archipelago. The report concludes, The ability to levy and collect taxes is probably the ultimate test of the existence of a government. I have had the account books of the insurgent government in this office balanced, and extracts made from the accounts which are of interest. These books covered the period from May 31, 1898 to September 10, 1899. The amounts duly credited gives a total cash collection for that period of 2,586,733 pesos and 48 centavos. This amount is charged to the province islands of Albay, Abra, Batanes Islands, Bataan, Batangas, Pabuyanes Islands, Binguet, Bulacan, Camarines, Cagayan, Cavite, Cebu, Ilocos Norte, Ilocos Sur, Lepanto, Laguna, Leyte Island, Isabela, Infanta, Masbate Island, Marinduque, Morong, Mindanao Island, Mindoro Island, Manila, Nueva Ecija, or as it is pronounced today, Nueva Ecija, Nueva Vizcaya, Negros Island, Panay Island, Pampanga, Pangasinan, Romblon Island, Sorsogon, Samar Island, Tayabas, Tarlac, Union, Zambales. These records show that the stamps were printed and used on correspondence where postal routes were organized, that revenue stamps were required upon paper certifying to transfer of cattle and real estate, that telegrams had to be stamped, and that a system of stamp paper for official and legal documents similar to that employed by the Spanish government, was adopted. There are among the records in this bureau stamped envelopes which have passed through the insurgent post and documents of various kinds drawn up upon stamp paper issued by the insurgent government, sufficient in volume and extent to establish the fact that a considerable sum must have been derived from their sales. From May 31, 1898 to February 15, 1899, 102,940 pesos 
and 60 centavos were received from postage and telegraph stamps. These original papers on file here show that the insurgent government, under the various names, dictatorship, revolutionary government, republic, which it assumed at the will of its leaders, exercised many, if not all, the powers of a de facto government. The fact it was not recognized does not affect the statement. Until it was disintegrated under the shattering blows of the forces of the United States, it raised armies, laid and collected taxes and custom duties, provided for trial by process of law of both civil and criminal cases, provided for a postal and telegraph system, and chose officials for its civil government by a method which, however little it may have considered the desires and aspirations of the government, was yet effective and orderly in its action. When we consider the evidence presented, President William McKinley's claim that the Filipinos assailed our sovereignty almost seems like a very cruel joke. Not only because Private William Grayson made no effort to hide the fact that he fired the first shot on February 4, 1899 that would spark the Philippine-American War, but also because on that date, so-called American authority in the Philippines was practically non-existent, both physically and legally. American presence, as can be seen in the reports quoted, was largely limited to Manila, but even that was questionable. Long before the first commanding general of the United States Army, General Wesley Merritt, would arrive in the Philippines, Filipinos had already surrounded Manila. This can be seen in Admiral Dewey's report on June 12, 1898, the same day President Emilio Aguinaldo proclaimed the independence of the Philippines wherein he states that the Filipino revolutionaries continue hostilities and have practically surrounded Manila. They have taken 2,500 Spanish prisoners, whom they treat most humanely. The Filipinos' hold on Manila was such that when the U.S. Army finally arrived, the Americans had to ask the Filipinos for their permission to occupy their trenches in order to advance on the Spanish walled city of Intramuros in Manila. For instance, on July 29, 1898, General Francis V. Green would write to the Filipino General Mariano Noriel the following. Sir, in pursuance of our conversation of yesterday and the message which Captain Arevalo brought to me during the night, I beg to inform you that my troops will occupy the entrenchments between the Camino Real and the beach, leaving camp for that purpose at 8 o'clock this morning. I will be obliged if you will give the necessary orders for the withdrawal of your men. Thanking you for your courtesy, I remain very respectfully your obedient servant, F. V. Green, Brigadier General Commanding. Furthermore, when the final push for Intramuros finally came on August 13, 1898, Filipino forces liberated a number of Manila suburbs and advanced through Sampaloc, Pandacan, Tondo, Santa Mesa, Paco, and Santa Ana. In addition, according to the American war correspondent John T. McCutcheon, the Filipino revolutionaries occupied the waterworks that controlled the flow of water that entered Intramuros, which is actually the part of Manila that the American forces captured. It can be said then that even American authority in the one city that they could claim to have captured was, in reality, rather limited. Therefore, even if the prevailing doctrine of that era called the right of conquest had been applied, President McKinley's claim of American authority over all Manila, let alone the entire Philippine archipelago, was absolutely absurd. American presence in the Philippines was so minuscule in comparison to the First Philippine Republic that by the very definition of an insurrection, it would actually be more accurate to refer to the military conflict during Aguinaldo's presidency as the American insurrection, as the American forces bottled up primarily within and near Intramuros were uprising against an already established government. Critics may argue that what American military forces lacked in physical presence they made up for in terms of legal authority, considering that the U.S. could claim the Philippines by way of the 1898 Treaty of Paris. However, it is important to point out that there are significant flaws to this argument. 
Despite the peace protocol, which allowed American forces to temporarily occupy Manila during treaty negotiations, the U.S. legal claim to the capital of Manila is questionable. Not only was Manila not completely conquered by American forces, which should have invalidated U.S. claims to it under the doctrine of right of conquest, the portion of it that was conquered by the U.S. Army on August 13 was done so after Spain and America's representatives signed a peace protocol the day before, on August 12. Even the chairman of the U.S. Peace Commission, Judge William Day, whom President McKinley appointed to negotiate a peace treaty with the Spanish in Paris, would question this claim. Writing on November 3, 1898, Chairman William Day observed, After a careful examination of the authorities, the majority of the commission are clearly of the opinion that our demand for the Philippine Islands cannot be based on conquest. When the protocol was signed, Manila was not captured, siege was in progress, and capture made after the execution of the protocol. Assuming hypothetically that the claim to Manila could be legally justified, President McKinley's claim of sovereignty over the whole of the Philippines cannot be upheld by the 1898 Treaty of Paris, in which Spain was forced, under the implicit threat of a continuation of war, to sell the Philippines. Aside from the fact that Spain sold military stations and provinces they already relinquished to the Filipinos, without the consent of the first Philippine Republic's representatives to Paris, the 1898 Treaty, even if valid, was not in effect on February 4, 1899. Let me repeat. The 1898 Treaty, even if valid, was not in effect on February 4, 1899. That is, on the day when Private Grayson ignited the war between the Americans occupying a portion of Manila and the First Philippine Republic. The United States Constitution, under Article 2, Section 2, requires the approval of two-thirds of the members of the United States Senate to officially ratify any treaty, which on February 4, 1899, the U.S. Senate had not done. Therefore, President McKinley did not have any legal justification to claim sovereignty over the Philippines, which had not yet been annexed when war broke out and American troops advanced on Filipino lines in Manila, and subsequently, the rest of the provinces under the authority of the First Philippine Republic. Some may contend that while the U.S. Senate had not officially annexed the Philippines on February 4, 1899, it was inevitable that it would do so on the scheduled date for voting on February 6, 1899. However, the treaty's ratification was not a foregone conclusion. It was only passed by one vote, and one of those senators who voted in favor of it, the Democrat, Augustus Bacon was actually against the annexation of the Philippines. Senator Bacon was forced to betray his principles out of a patriotic duty to support U.S. troops once the war started, just two days earlier. As Senator Bacon himself would explain, While I did not approve of the war and did not approve of the enslavement of the Filipinos, and while if I had my way I would immediately set them free, at the same time, as war was then flagrant, and there were then some 20-odd thousand American troops in the Philippine Islands. We must either support them or leave them to defeat and death. It is tempting to speculate on the various possible outcomes had war between the former Filipino and American allies had not broken out, but as no time machine exists to undo the past and given the numerous outcomes, the audience of this lecture will be spared of such pointless and endless conjectures. Instead. I simply ask American historians, the American government, and the President of the United States to recognize, even if posthumously, what the U.S. Senate failed to do that day and what President McKinley and his supporters had successfully denied ever since, that the Philippines, prior to its annexation on February 6, 1899, already had an independently functioning government called the Republica Filipina, or the First Philippine Republic, with Emilio Aguinaldo serving as its first president. This plea is not done with the intention of glorifying one man. For in truth, Filipinos of today could not care less about President Aguinaldo. The demonization and smear campaign against him 
during the American occupation by former friends and colleagues, from Admiral Dewey and General Merritt, to his secretary, Isabelo Artacho, and Prime Minister Apolinario Mabini, who used Aguinaldo as a scapegoat to excuse themselves of their own failures and wrongdoings, has succeeded in turning Filipinos of subsequent generations against him. Thus, this plea is not for his sake alone. The Republica Filipina, or the First Philippine Republic, is not the product of one man. From the Tagalog exiles who sold the First Philippine flag, and the Visayan revolutionaries who would hoist such a flag in Iloilo, to the 92 Filipino congressmen who ratified the 1899 Philippine Constitution, and the nameless thousands of Filipino patriots who gladly gave their lives in its defense. The First Philippine Republic was not the product of President Aguinaldo alone, but of the very thing that Secretary Root had denied. A nation. A Philippine nation. It is to these founding fathers and mothers who had their accomplishments stolen from them and their story relegated to the footnotes of American history that this effort for recognition is dedicated. America, and only America, can deliver justice for this unrecognized generation of Filipinos. Although the Spanish Parliament already acknowledged the government and presidency of Emilio Aguinaldo in 2011, ultimately, Spain was not responsible for the overthrow of the First Philippine Republic. True justice can only be served when the party responsible for this illegal act of aggression against an ally acknowledges the government it overthrew without just cause. Anything short of this is not justice. Even the acknowledgement of previous U.S. Secretaries of State, Mr. John Kerry and Mrs. Hillary Clinton, of Philippine Independence Day as June 12, 1898, fall short of true justice, because without the recognition of the First Philippine Republic's existence and sovereignty, Philippine independence could still be misrepresented as nothing more than a proclamation, rather than an actual achievement of Filipino independence from Spain. The accounts presented demonstrate that the highest-ranking American officers and officials were well aware of the existence and authority of the First Philippine Republic including Secretary Root, who received the military reports quoted in this lecture. The reports notwithstanding, they denied such knowledge before a trusting American public and in the case of Admiral Dewey, before a U.S. Senate committee, which, in retrospect, should have amounted to perjury. The fact that Mindanao was not yet fully incorporated cannot be used as an excuse, nor can it justify their denial. Only six years earlier in Hawaii, the United States set the precedent of recognizing governments with far less jurisdiction and popular support than the First Philippine Republic. One such government was the self-proclaimed Provisional Government of Hawaii, which was led by Lauren Thurston and Sanford Dole, two Anglo-Hawaiians of American descent. Even without the support of the majority of the native Hawaiian population, and without having occupied the chain of islands that make up Hawaii, Sanford Dole's provisional government of Hawaii immediately received recognition and military assistance from the United States through its minister, John L. Stevens, when Thurston and Dole orchestrated their overthrow of the internationally recognized head of state, Lilio Kolani, the queen of the kingdom of Hawaii. Given that Aguinaldo's 1899 government had far more popular support and territory under its jurisdiction, than the 1893 Provisional Government of Hawaii, as shown in the military reports quoted in this lecture. There really is no excuse today, nor was there any excuse in the past, for not officially recognizing the historical existence of the Republica Filipina, or the First Philippine Republic, as an independent nation and the presidency of its congressionally acknowledged head of state, Presidente Emilio Aguinaldo. If there are Americans today who feel that posthumously recognizing the First Philippine Republic and Aguinaldo's presidency would somehow bring shame to the United States, considering its role in its overthrow, it is important for them to realize that its willingness to repudiate and rectify a previous transgression not only demonstrates that the present disposition of the United States is not determined by its imperial past, 
but also displays America's honor and commitment to truth and justice. The only shame to speak of is if this present generation of Americans would act as an accomplice to President McKinley and his cronies by sustaining his denials and in so doing, prevent the past from being left to the past, as they would be perpetuating injustice to this very day. Yo así lo espero de la rectitud del gran pueblo de los Estados Unidos, donde si hay ambiciosos imperialistas también, existen valiosos círculos defensores de las humanitarias doctrinas de los inmortales Monroe, Franklin y Washington. Emilio Aguinaldo, presidente de la República Filipina, 1899. Thank you.